so let me start today's lecture and uh, i will okay i'll probably waste some 10 or 15 minutes by rehashing some of the stuff that professor mithun already discussed but uh, okay you can say i have a different point of view compared to him so i hope that uh, looking at things from a slightly different point of view will be helpful to you uh, first let us talk a little bit of history the one of the most famous equations in physics is Newton's law of gravitation. So, how did Newton derive this? Because an apple fell over his head. Well, actually the story comes from Newton himself, though he didn't say apple fell over his head. He was a student at Cambridge University and there was a plague, so university authorities sent all the students home. And Newton's fam family owned a farm, his father passed away and his mother was managing the farm. So seeing the young son at home, told him to do some useful work. So sent him out to the farm to do some work. And of course, doing instead of doing any farm work, Newton started dreaming. In particular, he claimed he saw an apple tree and he saw moon on top. Can you see moon in the daytime? Yes or no? Yeah, you can. And this is Newton's own story. So while he was watching the moon over the apple tree, an apple fell. So he started thinking about the motion of the moon versus the motion of the apple. And he knew very well that moon moves in a circular orbit around earth and 10 years before Huygens derived the formula for centrifugal force. So Newton knew that the acceleration of moon is omega square r. Omega, what is omega for moon? How do you calculate omega for moon? Omega is 2 pi by t. What is t? Sorry? Okay, I he hear two numbers, 28 and 27. Any other? What is the duration of a month? When I say month, I don't mean the month of the English calendar month as defined by the motion of moon. Well, how do you define a month in Indian calendar? Hmm? It's the time between one Amavasya to next Amavasya, though in some regions it is defined from one Purnima to next Purnima. But is that time, is that the time taken by moon 
to complete one revolution around earth. Okay, let's take along the KBC lines, let's take an audience poll. How many say yes? Nobody? So, the time from one Amavasya to another Amavasya, is that the time taken by moon to complete one revolution around earth? Yes, how many votes for yes? How many votes for no? And I see there are a lot of fence sitters. Well, answer is no. And those who voted no should explain to your friends why the answer is no. Anyway, you think about it and figure it out for yourself. And the T here is 27 days plus and uh, in Indian astronomy, is there a number 27 anywhere? What is that number? Where does that number come from? What is the number 27 in Indian astronomy? If you look at any of the Indian calendars, like I don't know, Kal Nirnai or whatever, you find that every day is associated with a Tithi and a Nakshatra. And the number of nakshatras are 27 and that 27 comes from this. The, the sky is divided into 27 nakshatras and the moon spends one day in the space allotted for each nakshatra. And the names of Indian months are associated with, well, in the lunar calendar, there is no Indian calendar, there is a solar calendar and a lunar calendar. And in the Indian lunar calendar, the name of the month is given by the name of the nakshatra on the day of Purnima, where the moon is. Like in the month of Ashwin, moon on the, on the Purnima day of the month of Ashwin, moon is in the star Ashwini, etc, etc. So, Newton knew Omega and he knew the R, the earth sun distance, uh, earth moon distance was known. So he could calculate omega square R and of course he knew the value of little g and he took the ratio and found that this is radius of earth divided by r. Strictly speaking, this should be r plus radius of earth, but radius of earth is much smaller compared to this, so that can be neglected. So that gave a clue to Newton that this force varies as 1 over r square. But then going from there to show that that force leads to Kepler's laws, required great skill of mathematics and in particular it required calculus which Newton had already developed. So he applied those calculus methods and showed that this 1 over r square 
leads to Kepler's laws and also proved the reverse. Kepler's laws lead to the 1 over r square force. Except that all this he did in 1666, but he did not bother to tell anybody. But 20 years later, Edmund Halley of Halley's comet fame, he heard through some rumors that Newton solved this problem. So, went and flattered him and Newton admitted, yes, I solved the problem. So, Halley persuaded Newton to write it up and Newton wrote his famous book, Principia. But nobody was willing to publish it because, I mean, it was too dense. So, Halley put up his own money to publish the book and, but Newton had a problem. Only he knew calculus, nobody else knew. <laughs> so, so, if he published a book using calculus as a mathematical technique, nobody would accept it. So, he painstakingly translated his calculus based proofs into proofs based on Euclidean geometry and if you look up Principia, you find that all the proofs use only Euclidean geometry, they do not use calculus, I mean calculus as we know. And of course, later Newton and Leibniz had a famous fight about who invented calculus. Anyway, I told all this story because I wanted to write this formula and write the analogous formula where r hat is the along so coulomb when he started working with charges sorry minus where yeah So, he knew of Newton's law and working with charges is a tricky thing, but he knew about it. So, first thing he did is he measured the forces between the charges and tried to fit it into a mathematical form and to his delight he found a mathematical form which is very similar to what Newton had. So, instead of g, there is some other constant. Of course, this 4 pi epsilon naught is a modern notation and there is a 1 over r square and r hat where r hat is the line joining the two charges just as this r hat is the line joining these two masses and you have m1, m2, you have q1, q2. And in fact, the notion of quantity of charge coulomb comes from this equation. Now, the next important step, by the way, coulomb talked only in terms of forces. The next important step was taken by Faraday and he is the one who introduced electric field. 
and before we go to electric field let me indulge in a little bit of more digression here masses are always positive which means the gravitational force is always attractive whereas we know charges can be positive or negative which means that this electrostatic force can be attractive between unlike charges and repulsive between like charges and in coulomb's time that was just a mathematical curiosity that masses are always positive but charges can be positive or negative but then next faraday introduced the concept of electric field of course faraday introduced it because he was dealing with time varying situations where electric field is a more convenient quantity to handle and then next maxwell introduced a correction into ampere's law so that the loss of electricity and magnetism they formed a consistent whole and then next people when they looked at moving charges they found that moving charges emit radiation and those ra that radiation is most convenient to describe in terms of electric and magnetic fields and this whole development was based on this important concept that maxwell introduced the concept of a field electric field and magnetic field then later einstein felt so the, from coulomb's law one step by step went to the concept of electric field and magnetic field and you have this whole electri electricity and magnetism described using what is called a field theory whereas gravitation was still described by an equation like this for about uh, 250 years einstein felt that gravitation also should be described by a field theory so when he attempted to construct a field theory the restriction that the gravitational force is always attractive made the field theory of gravitation quite complicated and in fact the field theory of electricity and magnetism first we describe it in terms of electric and magnetic fields and then these two we describe in terms of a scalar potential and a vector potential so essentially four objects one scalar potential and three components of a vector potential that describes everything about electricity magnetism but when you try to construct a field theory for gravity where the force is always attractive the structure of that field theory is much more complicated and in fact one had to describe it using a a 10 component tensor called the gravitational tensor so uh, i mean you see how things progressed you start from here come here and then you develop a field theory here but then you try to develop a field theory for this equation mathematically that turns out to be much more complicated and you end up with a very fancy theory which we now call general relativity and of course there are attempts to put this theory and this theory together in one theory but as of now no such attempts are not yet successful 
So after all this digression, let us get back to Coulomb's law. So I have a charge Q1 at location R1 and another charge Q2 at location R2. And the Coulomb's law says force on 1 due to charge 2 is equal to 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught times Q1 Q2 divided by mod R1 minus R2 whole square along the line joining the two. But that word along the line joining the two, I can't, I want to write it as an equation. And the line joining these two points is the difference between these two position vectors. It does not matter where my origin is, but the line connecting these two points is along this position vector, <laughs> the difference of these two position vectors. So I prefer to write this as Q times R1 minus R2. So strictly speaking, this is how one should write the Coulomb's law. I allow position of my Q1 at an arbitrary point R1, position of my Q2 at another arbitrary point R2 and ask what is the force on 1 due to 2. That is the notation I am using and that is proportional to R1 minus R2. Yeah. That is a extremely complicated story. I do not want to get into it now. Take it for granted that uh, and there are of some people who start giving galis once you start this business about epsilon naught mu naught. They think that I mean epsilon naught and mu naught should be banned from physics. But they have been there and yeah. Now let us now assume that there is another charge Q3 at R3 then the force on 1 due to 3 I can write in a similar way and that will be proportional to this vector R1 minus R3. Now I ask what is the force on 1? I do not care where the other charges are, I will look at all the other charges and ask, I am looking only at this point and ask what is the force here and obviously that is the vectorial sum of F12 and F13 and 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught rather I will keep it later. This is Q1 times 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught times Q2 by R1 minus R2 whole cube R1 minus R2 plus Q3 dot dot dot. So 
by the way I should put a my charge 1 is at R1 and force on that due to Q2 depends on R1 minus R2 and force on 1 due to Q3 depends on R1 minus R3. So, this is what Faraday proposed. This he said I will write as Q1 times electric field at the point R1. So, whatever is in this curly bracket rather in the square bracket is the electric field. So, now what is the interpretation? Charge Q2 which is at R2 is creating the electric field at R1 given by this and similarly charge Q3 which is at R3 is creating an electric field given by the up similar factor. And the vectorial sum of this electric field due to 2 and vectorial sum due to electric field 3 gives me the net electric field E at R1 and at R1 I put charge Q1 and the force on Q1 then is the magnitude of the charge times the electric field at that point due to the rest of the charges. So, this leads to the following notation I mean the concept is very simple, but you have to pay attention to the notation and if you do not you will end up in all kinds of troubles. So, in calculating electric field we talk about electric field at point R. So, it is estimated that we will keep our test charge at the point R and this electric field is the force that will be experienced by a unit test charge placed at point R. So, this is 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught sum over I going from 1 to n q i or rather first let me write it for one charge q divided by r minus r prime whole cube times r minus r prime. So, we put our the charge giving rise to the electric field we put at R prime and ask this charge at R prime what electric field is it giving rise to at point R. It is a simple matter of definition, but you should really absorb it because this notation is standard whenever you do field theory. So, the question we ask is I the source is at R prime and what is the effect at R which is some distance from the source. That is the question that we ask whenever we do field theory electric field, magnetic fields, whatever other field. So, this definition, so when you see these equations you should not get confused, you should not ask what is R, what is R prime etcetera. R is the location where you are measuring the effect, R prime 
is the location where the charge is which is causing that effect. So, I am putting the charge Q at R prime and it is giving rise to electric field EFR at R. And if I have multiple charges, then I use superposition principle and say that now this is 1 to n q i r minus r prime i divided by mod r minus r prime i q. So, this is how we define the electric field. When I have mul here I have multiple sources q1 at r1 prime, q2 at r2 prime, q3 at r3 prime, etc, etc. And if the charge distribution is a continuous distribution, then this becomes 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught integral rho which is now a function of r prime d tau prime. The location of the charge I am denoting by the r prime. So, and I have to integrate over it. So, that is why I am writing d tau prime. Uh, I should uh, write first r minus r prime d tau prime divided by mod r minus r prime whole q. Here I am assuming a volume charge distribution and Professor Mithun discussed how this thing look will look for line charge distribution and surface charge distribution. And having defined the electric field, we now talk about mean. What do we mean by a field? Field is a vector which is defined at over a region of space and as I move from point to point, the magnitude can change and the direction also can change. So, if I, if this is the region in which I am interested, then I consider various points and at each point, I put a vector. corresponding to the length of the vector corresponds to magnitude and of course, the direction. This is of course, a totally arbitrary field, but if you remember when we considered the divergence theorem, we considered the flux of a field. which where this S is any surface, it need not be closed. So, for example, let us just take a surface like this and to compute this quantity, we divide it into small elements of area and at each, at the center of each element of area, I evaluate what the electric field is and I take a dot product of that electric field with that element of area and I sum over all this. Now, if my electric field 
is purely in this plane, then E dot dA is 0 because the area element is normal to the plane. So, you have a non-zero flux only if there is a component of the field normal to the area that you are considering. Otherwise, the flux is zero. So, this is another concept you should understand. The flux is non-zero. When you have an open surface, this is the important thing. For an open surface, the flux is non-zero only if the field lines penetrate the surface, go through the surface. If the field lines do not penetrate the surface, then the flux is zero. Having said that, now let us consider a closed surface. So, I mean it is difficult for me to draw a closed surface, but let us consider a surface like that. And for example, let me consider a point charge here. The field lines from this point charge, they go like this. And you note that every field line which penetrates the surface inward this way is penetrating it outward this way. So, the flux due to this charge over this closed surface is 0. So, this is 0 if there is no This is another important concept I should have mentioned actually earlier. This equation it is a very important equation in the following sense. The electric charge we consider it as a source and the electric field is the effect and this source is responsible for this effect. So, and in fact, I mean you would have seen these religious paintings where a religious figure, they draw a aura around the religious fig figure so that if the religious figure moves around, the aura is supposed to move with that figure. So, that is the picture that we should think of here. Given a charge Q, this charge Q contains this aura of the electric field surrounding it. This picture is very different from what Coulomb originally proposed. Coulomb only said you put a charge here, you put a charge here, there is a force between them. It is a much simpler picture whereas, the picture with electric field is saying something more. It says that the moment you have a charge Q, surrounding this charge Q, there is this aura of the electric field which will always be there surrounding that. And so, you have this source Q which is creating this field, the aura and now if you ask for the flux of this aura, if the source is outside the closed surface, then the flux is 0, but on the other hand, if the source happens to be inside the closed surface, then you have field lines going like this and you will have the flux of the electric field in this case is non-zero. 
and question is how to compute this flux this one can do very easily for a point charge at origin or rather for a point charge electric field is is proportional to or rather and I take a spherical surface surrounding this and it is easy to see that you get the you get it to be q by epsilon naught. Now let us consider the following case. Suppose I have a q1 here and a q2 here and I consider a surface like this. What is the electric field flux through this surface? I mean you all know the answer, but starting from here, how do I calculate this? Well, one thing I can do is I consider a small spherical surface here and I can calculate, I can consider a small spherical surface here and then rest of the surface. So I have this big surface with two holes inside and I can show that or if you want I can split this into, I can create a surface like this and another surface like this. So there will be a surface like this etc. I can split it into this spherical surface plus this spherical surface plus various other spherical surfaces and I can show that within this within this surface there is no charge, so the flux through that is 0 and etc, etc and whatever flux is going through here has to go here, I can make that argument and finally argue that the flux through this outer surface is equal to the flux through this spherical surface and the flux through this spherical surface, so it should be equal to q1 plus q2 by epsilon naught. So you can always make a construction like this so that there will be a spherical surface, a small spherical surface surrounding each charge and then the rest of the surface you can break it up into smaller surfaces through which there is no flux so that net flux encom encompassing the whole set of charges is equal to the total charge enclosed by this whole surface. And next we consider the divergence of this electric field. We have the divergence theorem which says that this is but this we just showed that this is q enclosed by epsilon naught but oh, oh i forgot to put the d tau here sorry but the enclosed charge I can always write as 
a volume integral of and this equation should hold for any volume and any surface which encloses that. So, if this integral is equal to this integral for any volume that will be possible only if the integrand here is equal to the integrand here and we have del dot E is equal to and this is the first of the Maxwell's equations. And the greatness of the equation is the following. We have derived this equation for electrostatic situation where the charges are not moving. But we find that this is also true when we find that this equation is true more generally where even for a charge density which is changing with respect to time, this equation divergence of E is equal to the charge density that holds. Whereas the Coulomb law, this does not hold for a moving charge. It is true that starting from here, we derived integral E dot dA is equal to the charge enclosed and from that we derived this. So, from Coulomb's law we get this, but from this we will not get a Coulomb's law for a moving charge. And I am not going to discuss now why this equation should hold for a moving charge. We will worry about it later, but I am emphasizing the importance of this equation in the formulation of electricity magnetism. We derive this from Coulomb's law, but it is actually a more general law. It is valid not only for electrostatic situation, but even in a situation where the charges are moving around. Now, why can't I go back in the reverse? Well, we got this equation from this equation. And in this equation, we are integrating the electric field over a surface. Whereas, this equation is giving me electric field explicitly. So, the information contained in this equation is more compared to the information contained in this equation to give you a more easy to visualize a language, more easy to visualize. I am sure all of you carry some cash in your pockets and suppose somebody goes around and tells explicitly, okay, how much money each person has and makes a table, that is a lot of information. But then somebody adds up all the numbers and say that people sitting in this room have let us say 10,000 rupees in their pockets together. That is some information, but it is much less detailed than who has 
how much cash in each person with each person so that is why here this is the total flux so i am integrating over the electric field over a large area so the information contained here is much less than the information contained here so that is why starting from this point i cannot reverse the logic and get the electric field for a time dependent charge and that's actually a very complicated problem but you have all done problems where you calculate electric field using gauss's law but you should remember you have used symmetry there me suppose somebody gives me 10000 rupees and say distribute this money among the students in the class there are sort of huge number of ways in which i can do the distribution but if the instruction is distribute that money equally among all the students then there is a unique way i can do the distribution so when you use gauss's law to calculate the electric field you are using that symmetry that the electric field in this direction should be same as electric field in that direction and it is the symmetry which is allowing you allowing you to calculate the electric field from gauss's law without the symmetry you cannot do much with gauss's law next we discuss the the concept of potential first thing is we can show that the electric field given by coulomb's law the curl of it is zero first i can show it for one point charge and then if i have a large number of point charges i use the same argument as in the case of the surface integral i can use the same argument as here for line integrals and show that the curl even for multiple charges is zero which means that electric field can be written as gradient of some scalar function because curl of a gradient is always zero but the way by the way here the electric field is the derivative of some function since there is a derivative involved if i define if i add a constant to this function that constant doesn't enter into the derivative therefore this we should remember potentials are always defined only up to a constant and in fact the physical quantity we define is potential difference you take it to be the definition of potential difference now the question is why did i why is there a minus sign here just to complicate life well not really 
the definition again comes from the gravitational analogy. Gravitationally, you know what is the region of high field, high potential, high potential energy and what is the region of low potential energy. And if I put a mass in a region of high potential energy and there is no force to sort of stabilize it, then the mass naturally moves from region of high potential to region of low potential. So we apply exactly the same concept here. We say that a charge and in this case we actually consider a unit positive test charge, it moves from a region of high pot if I put a unit positive chest test charge somewhere and then leave it, it naturally moves from a region of high potential to a region of low potential. So it is based on that this definition is given and having written this definition we say it in words. It is the work done on a unit positive test charge in moving it from point A to point B. See, there is a charge Q here and if I put my test charge at point A due to Q, there is a force equal to E and I am doing work which is to move it from A to B. So if I let this go then the charge will move like this but I am doing work to move it from A to B. So I need to apply a force which is equal and opposite to minus E. And also the work that is being done, it is I am moving the charge. So in principle the charge has a kinetic energy and strictly speaking I have to put in some extra work to give that kinetic energy. But I make the assumption that that kinetic energy is so small that it is negligible. So that is why we say that this is the work done to move a unit positive charge infinitesimally slowly from A to B. There is that phrase infinitesimally slowly that is there to indicate that the kinetic energy of this charge is negligibly small. So the work is done being done by the external force that I am applying and that external force is minus E, it is equal and opposite to the electric field of this charge Q. Therefore, the work done is minus E dot dl and that is from point A to point B. So that is why I have this minus sign in the definition. However, quite often we use a standard reference point and the standard reference point is R tending to infinity if If the charge that you are looking at, if the charge is finite, then we can consider the point at infinity to be a reference point and in fact we define, you can, we can show that the point at infinity 
you can assume it to have zero potential. But if the charge you consider is infinite, for example, an infinite line charge with uniform charge density or a surface, infinite surface with uniform surface charge density, in these cases the charge is infinite and you cannot take the point at infinity to have zero potential. But in all the cases where the charge at infinity, sorry, the total charge is zero, is not, total charge is finite. It can be large, but it can, it has to be finite. Whenever the total charge is finite, we will take the reference point to be point at infinity and and we can show that we can that reference point will we can take it to have zero potential then we can define potential at a point r and and I will not do the derivation, it is quite straightforward and the potential at point R will be 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught Q divided by R minus R prime where once again the assumption is that charge Q is at R prime and if there are multiple charges then this is 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught sum over I going from 1 to n Q I divided by mod R minus R prime I. and you see from this definition that if I take R tending to infinity, this potential vanishes. Therefore, this definition of the potential is consistent. And for continuous charge distributions, this becomes 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught integral rho of R prime d tau prime divided by mod r minus r prime. And this I have written for a volume charge distribution, but for a line charge distribution or surface charge distribution, you can write the appropriate, you can write the appropriate formula. Okay, I will stop here now.